All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our webinar on using the New York State Riparian Opportunity Assessment for Project and Resiliency Planning. And we have a great panel here to answer questions and provide a lot of information on this tool. Um, my name is Gabriel Yurden, and <clears throat> I'm here with the New York State Tug Hill Commission, and we're a small non-regulatory state agency um, tasked with enabling local governments and private organizations and indiv individuals to shape the future of the Tug Hill region and to demonstrate and communicate ways that this can be done in other rural areas. And we thought that this webinar would be a great opportunity for people in our area also to use this tool um, in a lot of different planning, both at the community level and organizational level. So I'm gonna just help with some facilitation here today. And um, some logistics for the webinar today, we do have a lot of people joining us. So there will be time partway through the presentation and also at the end for questions. And any questions that you have in the meantime, drop in the chat and we'll try to get one of our experts to answer them. So as of a couple of days ago, we had 143 people registered and it seemed like the information on this webinar had a pretty good spread. We had a couple of people registered from as far as New Jersey and Vermont and Massachusetts and all over New York State, Adirondacks, downstate, all the way over to Buffalo. And over 80 different groups, organizations were represented in the registry and 121 different people gave their locations. So hopefully this knowledge on the tool will be able to disperse through this. Um, and also from our registration questionnaire, it seemed that the majority of people weren't familiar with the New York State Repairing Opportunity Restoration Opportunity Assessment. So today should be a great, great opportunity to expand on that. And one of the questions in the questionnaire was briefly describe your experience, if any, using the tool, such as no experience, used to look at watershed conditions and risks, used to plan tree planting projects, et cetera. And some answers that we got from respondents on their experience were using the tool to look at watershed conditions and risks. And a lot of people had heard about it, but had never had the chance to use it. Um, so th some other answers that we had were estuary health, municipal projects, and planning um, tree plantings and restoration activities. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Emily. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel, for getting us started and for helping um, support the with the technical support for this webinar. And um, as many of you may know, my name is Emily Bell. I am the Eastern Great Lakes Watershed Coordinator for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's Great Lakes Program. And we work in partnership with the Water Resources Institute at Cornell University. And I've been with the team um, since 2014. And my role is working with stakeholders throughout the basin to advance shared goals for water quality, natural resources, sustainability, recreation, and resiliency throughout the St. Lawrence, Black River, Sandy Creeks, Oneida Lake and Eastern Lake Ontario tribut tributaries, as well as Oswego Seneca River watersheds, which is a total area of about 13,820 square miles. The goal of my presentation is to share a quick overview of my program, some background on rip the Riparian Restoration Opportunity Assessment, and simple ways to use the tool to identify project priorities for the protection and restoration of waterways, and getting feedback on the current and potential uses for the tool to inform a needs assessment and potential updates. And real quick, before getting into the ROA, I wanted to provide a little background on the DEC's Great Lakes program and what we do. In support of New York's Great Lakes Action Agenda, we help to coordinate on science and applied research, offer technical assistance to communities and organizations, including training and competitive grant programs. We support community engagement and stewardship through our sub-basin work groups and partner priority areas that you see in the yellow and green on the map. And um, these include the integrated watershed action plans that are being developed for those green areas. And um, we facilitate project identification and implementation. 
the Great Lakes Action Agenda is going through an update and we had public meetings and a public comment period in the fall, which we have worked to integrate into the agenda and hope to release the final GLAA within the next few months and, in big, and begin engaging the public and stakeholders. And if that sounds um, like something you'd like to get involved with, please email me and I'd be happy to add you to our listserv. We have six draft goals identified along with several cross-cutting priorities, which um, the goals include reducing toxics, controlling sediment, nutrient, and pathogen loading, invasive species control, conserving and restoring fish and wildlife, engaging, um, um, enhancing resiliency to floods and storms, and revitalizing communities. And riparian restoration achieves multiple benefits that align with the goals of New York's GLAA, including erosion and sediment control, flood mitigation, habitat restoration and protection, nutrient load reduction, and more. And um, if there, if you believe there's benefits I missed, feel free to include them in the chat and um, check out our DEC riparian buffer website, which um, we can include a link in the chat as well if um, you'd like to learn more about riparian buffers. And um, so the, um, the goal of the, rise, the statewide riparian opportunity assessment was to strategically identify and prioritize sites for riparian restoration to improve habitat, water quality, climate resiliency, and provide flood protection. And this was developed in, in January 2018 in coordination with the New York Natural Heritage Program and other partners. And um, I will invite the uh, members on the team that were able to enjoy us to join us today to um, introduce themselves and and uh, you know their their background and um, you know if if um, we have any questions that I'm unable to answer they have agreed to be available to help with that um, if you would like to um, introduce yourselves and I am going to pull up this poll while you do that. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Emily. Uh, sure, I'm Tim Howard. I'm the Director of Science at the New York Natural Heritage Program. And um, uh, hey, Emily was was one of the spearheads of this and, and helped us move along and helped us uh, work on this uh, opportunity assessment. And it's great to be able to come back and and um, and talk through this and, and um, think about how we can apply these information. But just a quick thing about the, the heritage program, the natural heritage program is um, we uh, are an information source of rare species and natural communities throughout the state. But also we support, we're a science, you know, nonprofit that supports prioritization and spatial analyses to support conservation and actions, management actions on the ground. So that's why we would do this kind of thing. And I'll pass it on to uh, Amy to introduce herself as well. Uh, I'm Amy Conley. I'm the spatial ecologist at Heritage. Um, the uh, riparian opportunity assessment uh, was originally uh, done just for the Great Lakes Basin um, and then expanded the 2018 product as statewide, but it was the Great Lakes project was like my first project here at Heritage. So uh, it's uh, fun to come back to it and see how uh, people are using it. Great, thank you. Thanks, Amy. And um... I am going to uh, go ahead and end this this poll. It looks like we got some great responses, and I believe um, I can share the results real quick for everyone to see. Um, and it looks like we have had folks um, say they have found the tool useful in identifying locations for projects, understanding ecological conditions and risks, resiliency planning within the variable width buffer zones promoting awareness about ecological conditions. And then um, we have folks say that they haven't um, used the tool before. And, and uh, Gabriel, were there any comments in, in the chat related to the usefulness of the tool? We had, we had one comment that microclimates to assist with wildlife rain shifts during a, um, changing climates could be a useful use. Oh, great. That's fantastic. Great to hear. All right. Um, so one of the um, one of the major questions that the statewide right, riparian opportunity assessment sought to answer was um, where we 
need riparian buffers and um, the the um, through the EPF, the Environmental Protection Fund, um, the New York Natural Heritage Program, I've worked with DEC watershed programs, lands and forests, New York State Department of Ag and Markets, and other key stakeholders to develop um, tools that would help inform these these questions. Um, and you know, buffers are riparian buffers. They're often included as a as a BMP in, in watershed plans, and the riparian opportunity assessment um, can be helpful in looking at at catchments and further ground truthing conditions to plan projects. Oh, oops. And uh, so within the riparian opportunity assessment, the um, there was inclusion of indicators of e ecological and health, as well as ecological stress that were used to develop comprehensive scores. And the details on where each indicator's data came from is available in the full report and on the website, including an indicator table that can be viewed as an Excel spreadsheet. Um, if you have any questions about any of the suite of indicators um, portrayed here that were that were used in the tools development. So um, one of the tools as, as identified on the on the website, this is the um, looking at the subwatershed comprehensive scores. And um, this uh, is an interactive online map that shows the comprehensive scores, score, scores <laughs> which were calculated by subcontracting ecological stress indicator scores from the ecological health indicator scores of subwatersheds at the HUC 12 scale. So the HUC 12 being the USGS um, subwatershed boundaries that are you know, um, draining draining stream or, or creeks that are, are draining to a, a larger river. Um, and that's a, this is a, a unit used to separate and manage waterways and the lands that drain to them and um, is also referred to as the, a sub-watershed. Um, so this map here was um, developed by Gabriel Yurden and um, this is using the downloadable database shapefile layers and um, Gabriel was able to do that in Arc G in QGIS and um, I highly encourage those that are interested in this type of GIS support within the Tug Hill region to connect with Gabriel Yurden um, because he's fantastic with with GIS and, and is happy to help you with your with your projects and um, you know, within the Tug Hill region, there were several areas um, that you can see that scored low um, that would benefit from uh, projects to restore ecological health and, and reduce, reduce stress, such as the, the town of Watertown in the Mill Creek headwaters, the city of Watertown in Lower Black River, the town of Rutland, the town of Lowellville, Martinsburg, and Harrisburg. And there were also areas that scored very high and would benefit from projects that protect these areas from becoming stress, um, including by preventing invasive species, forest pests from becoming established. Um, you know, we have hemlocks within our headwaters that are, are at risk um, from the hemlock woolly adelgid. So um, preventing the spread of hemlock woolly adelgid is, is important in those areas and, and protecting those trees, um, promoting sustainable development and protecting source waters. And these areas include uh, headwaters of Salmon Sand Creeks in um, Redfield, Osceola, and Montague, the headwaters of Oneida Lake in West Turn and Martinsburg, and the headwaters of the Black River and Forest Port and Remsen. And um, again, staff at Tug Hill Commission are available to assist communities with um, their riparian and uh, riparian project planning and uh, protection projects as well. And this is the map of ecological health scores for the subwatersheds at the statewide scale, which can be used to identify where riparian protection is needed to maintain those um, good ecological conditions that you see in the in the dark green, and the ecological stress scores that can be used to identify where restoration or other protect pro other projects are needed to uh, reduce the stressors at that. Um, sub watershed scale and you see here in the in the darker red um the more stressed areas and the um sort of lighter orange or the the less the less stressed or the pinkish color less stressed and within the um 
this interactive online map, you can also look at the, uh, the contents of uh, an individual indicator. In this example, we have um, the erosion index, which can um, be helpful to see where there is um, high erosion risk and possibly you know, areas that would benefit from stream bank stabilization projects. And this interactive map shows the uh, smaller catchment area scores. This is, a, this is available as a separate link on the website um, where you can uh, see you know, the, the relative catchment score within each sub watershed. So um, the scores are not comparable across sub watersheds, but with only within the sub watersheds and compare each catchment to the next. So if you, you know, had a had a low scoring sub watershed, um, you can you can see you know where areas are particularly stressed within that particular sub watershed. And um, there's also themes on this catchment map. For example, we have this um, public land theme. And uh, public lands are really low-hanging fruit where projects can be implemented to um, achieve, you know, the greatest public benefits and, um, you know, identify those areas. And this will also show um, the name and the location of the public land, in this case, um, the Tug Hill State Forest I have selected here. And um, it does show um, local parks and the um, land trust uh, protected areas as well. So um, that's kind of really helpful to see, you know, especially um, if you're looking for uh, more protection, this darker gray is, is where there is uh, no public lands. And the Data Explorer, which is a, another separate link on the website, is another useful tool for project planning that was developed, which enables you to select a region. Here we have the, the Black River watershed and uh, some of Shimo Perch, and um, this enables you to uh, see the indicators um, as tables here at the bottom portraying ecological health and stress. And you can also see um, a graphic showing where each sub each sub watershed lies um, within you know this matrix. And I'm going to show you a kind of a, a zoom, a close up of what this looks like. And um, when I see this, this matrix here, I really think of um, the uh, time management matrix as I see it being really helpful to see um, where projects are urgent and important over in this um, really stressed, you know, uh, low scoring ecological health area. And then seeing where projects are important, but not urgent in this, um, you know, uh, area where you have the the higher health and lower stress scores, so that that can be helpful in um, you know focusing your your time on on those uh, very important, very urgent uh, management needs. And uh, this is uh, the um, data explorer um, looking at Mill Creek, but you can use this graph uh, to see how each um, indicator is contributing to the overall health and stress within your sub watershed in, in, in this case. So you see um, where topographic wetness, this is, this is really where um, water comes off as a sheet and um, that, that, that's contributing to stress in this in the sub watershed. You see dam storage ratio. This is, this is where um, your natural floodwaters are held in by dams, um, which, which affects you know, the overall riparian health. You can see that's contributing stress. And then um, you have low you know, health scores for e ecological significance and um, flood floodplain complexes there too. So it's um, you know, good to see uh, what how each uh, indicator is contributing to the overall health of this subwatershed. And then um, once you have a subwatershed that you are particularly interested in focusing on, you can then look at the catchment scores within that subwatershed to see you know, specific areas that are um, contributing the, the most stress or you know, could use uh, the most 
management to to help address those stressors. So in this case, you know, we focused in right on this kind of area in the in the Lowville area um, to see how how it is stressed. And then you can toggle and zoom in and turn the layers on and off and look at your riparian area. And here we have this section of Mill Creek that is just across from, or, or this is the wastewater treatment plant here. This is the funeral home across the bank here. And you see that there is very little riparian cover along this long stretch of Mill Creek where um, this area could really benefit from some additional tree planting. And you know, seeing the way that the bluff looks here, it looks like there could be some erosion and, and you know, some need to, to stabilize the stream bank there as well. Um, so this could really be a good area to plan out um, you know, a riparian restoration or a, a planting project and you know, um, getting getting in touch with like the funeral director and some landowners could be a good good next step um, and you know doing a, a site assessment as well to um, to further uh, look at this uh, area and determine the the conditions there and um, get you know some photo documentation about what that looks like would also be kind of a, a good next step to take so um, another way that you can use this data explorer for project planning is to identify priority areas for protection. And here we have the um, Oswego Oneida um, River watershed, and um, we see here, um, you know, I highlighted these uh, very important but not urgent um, this area here, and you see that um, these these headwaters of the Oneida River Oneida Lake watershed are a really high priority here, um, and you know, kind of come up as that that really really. Uh, dark blue and so looking at those areas this is the east branch of fish creek and you can see i use this street map view that you can toggle to be able to look at um existing public lands here and see you know where the existing state forest boundary is and so um this being a um, source water area, this could be a good um, tool to identify where um, you could apply for the land acquisition for source water protection funding um, to acquire more lands in support of protecting these, these source waters. So um, you can see that here on this map. And um, so once you have used this map to really identify some high priority areas, um, there's a couple of uh, great resources that can be used to um, to help plan out your your project and help to um, assess the the stream. If you don't have a lot of experience or are just getting started, this could be a good way to to better understand what to to look for and how to do that, how to document that um, in your grant applications. And um, these are two great resources that. Um, I had found that I, I find useful the stream processes, a guide to living in harmony with streams. This is from Chemung County Soil and Water, and it has, you know, a, a, a form you can fill out um, and, you know, pictures and images of what to look for when you're doing your stream assessment. Um, and then this stream corridor assessment guide from Upper Susquehanna Coalition, which was developed for agricultural environmental management, but I can see uses um, you know, for for doing stream corridor assessments, looking at the the different zones within a stream and and um, identifying what what to note and what kind of observations to to record on a um, observation form. So, um, just a couple of additional plot project planning resources that um, can be helpful as you're planning out your project um, are. The DEC website on how to plant a tree, um, if you're kind of just getting started with um, tree planting can be really helpful um, in de just deciding what trees to plant, where to plant them, how to plant them. Um, and then the DEC plan planting and caring for your seedlings. So um, gives you um, details on how to maintain those trees after they're planted, um, doing things like mulching and pruning and, and fencing, you know, to keep the deer away. Um, and then DEC is managing invasive Plants in Riparian Areas guidance is available as well. These resources are all on this um, 
this website here, which can be um, shared in the chat. And then um, really encouraging to connect with your uh, soil and water conservation districts who can provide assistance, um, typically have foresters, um, agricultural environmental management planners on staff and can help you uh, plan out a project. And uh, your local Cornell Cooperative Extension Office can offer um, some additional guidance. Uh, the Cornell Cooperative Extension in, in Thompson County, Tompkins County recently developed this really neat um, riparian buffer resources guide with a, with a list of all kinds of resources that are available, which um, we can include that, that link. And then um, DEC Forest Stewards, um, county planning, they can especially help you with things like local tree ordinances or model local laws for, um, for riparian buffers or stream buffers. Um, and then your local land trust, which could really help, you know, with with uh, getting a, a con conservation easement or possibly, you know, looking at your land, doing a, you know, some um, evaluation of the the value of that land and what kind of conservation action is needed. And another resource that I wanted to share, this is a new resource from DEC. It is called the Funding Finder, and. This is a really neat Excel spreadsheet that's available at this link and you will download to your computer, which you can use to um, search under the search engine tab for a project based on what type of applicant you are and the type of project you're looking to do. Um, so here, for example, I selected a nonprofit private entity and um, the project type was nature-based shorelines and um, a bunch of different grants come up that um, might be able to fund my project, including water quality improvement project grants from DEC and um, DEC environmental justice grants, the New York State Environmental Facilities Green Innovation Grant Program, and um, Parks Environmental Protection Fund were, were all um, potential uh, funds for, for supporting these projects. And some other potential map uses for maps and tools. I'm going to uh, bring up this poll. Um, another poll. Manage poll. And oops, that worked. Okay. Um, I don't know what's going on because I feel like I should be getting. Okay, here we go. Launch. So um, I want to get a sense of, um, you know, how the plans to use the tool um, based on this webinar, if, you know, if this helped you really understand how the tool is useful and if um, you might use it for things like strategic planning or project development, funding applications such as DEC's Trees for Tribs in the Hudson Watershed, the New York Sea Grant, Great Lakes Small Grants, Climate Smart Communities, water quality improvement project funding and, and more. Um, outreach and engagement to share, you know, the conditions in your in your local watersheds, um, promote awareness about, about that, the indicators that um, are affecting the conditions or evaluating outcomes towards improving catchments and subwatershed scores um, possibly as new data becomes available. And um, give it another minute to uh, participate in the in the poll. It looks like we have about thirty five folks that participated. And well, while while you're waiting, I'll just weigh in and reiterate uh, what you said, Emily, earlier. Is that there's really, I guess, four ways to get at the sort of the data that we provided as part of this project. There were two ArcGIS online map viewers and so Emily showed us those screenshots of those and then there's that um, uh, data data tool the uh, the the navigator thing that that would has the graph and the charts and that's another way to view the information at um, in different graphical ways and then of course you can download and use it in your own own GIS if you want to so the so there's the there's a lot of different ways you can you can look and use the information. And that and you can get to them all from that the website that uh, Kristen shared earlier in the chat. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for adding that, Tim. And um, 
just uh, looking real quick at the at the results, we have you know some folks that are going to ground truth areas to plan for projects using the tool. Um, they're going to use the ecological conditions and, and grant applications. Um, they'll use the tool for resiliency planning, and um, there was also other. Was there a comment in the chat about that, Gabriel? Yeah, we had a couple of comments in the chat, um, including adding information from the tool to a watershed management plan, potentially assessing contributing environmental conditions for surficial drinking water systems, um, using it to optimize location of buffers to reduce erosion on stream banks, and also checking against their SWOT model results for the Owasco Lake watershed. Well, great. That's great. Thanks for sharing. And I'm going to stop sharing that. And um, with that, and um, thank you. So um, just uh, thinking about some potential future uses for the ROA um, with, with updates, you know, to all the indicators. Uh, for example, here we have the um, known water impairments, which um, this was from before 2018. And, you know, we have the um, 2022 draft water body impairments come out um, more recently. And there, there were, you know, some changes to, to some of these, um, some of the waterways. So, you know, we could see that kind of being updated as that becomes finalized. But, um, you know, as other indicators, um, you know, have new data available and we're able to rerun the tool. Um, it could potentially um, be used to evaluate trends over time between, um, you know, the conditions when uh, the tool was developed in 2018 and whenever, you know, we're able to to make an update to the to the tool. So um, had some ideas, but um, I'm going to go ahead and share, you know, this uh, poll on the interest in, in an update. Um, and you know, just asking if it would be useful in assessing trends in ecological conditions. And if there are other, other thoughts you'd want to share on um, how a, a update to the tool could be useful, please share um, that in the chat. And I'll give it another, I'll give it up to a minute before I close it out. Some of the metrics gone into the roll-up overall condition and stressor metrics were based on things like the land use, land cover, data sources and things. And those those do change over time. And so having an updated, you know, rerunning this with an updated version of land use and land cover, I think would be pretty instructive. And I think I think if you look at the detail and some of the, the lists of metrics we used, there may be others that could be included and applied. Yes, thank you, Tim. And I'm going to go ahead and end that poll and share the results. So it looked like um, most people thought that the update would be helpful in, in assessing trends, um, and some were, were not sure. Um, and, you know, Maybe the maybe some of those folks weren't familiar as familiar with the tool, but um, that's that's good good to hear that you know there there'd be you know is, is some interest in um, seeing a tool the tool be updated, and I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, and with that um, I will wrap up this uh, presentation with a. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, which is uh, the planting of a tree, especially one of the long living hardwood trees is a gift which you can make to posterity posterity, at almost no cost and with almost no trouble. And if the tree takes root, it will far outlive the visible effects of any of your other actions, good or evil. And that's by George Orwell. And this is, uh, 
This is a photo of a tree water town uh, tree planting event that engaged volunteers in a tree planting on a very low scoring section for comprehensive scores on the Black River in the city of Watertown. And um, it's it's been great to be part of that effort. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Kristen Hitchka with the Cornell Water Resources Institute, um, who is a geographer and runs climate and riparian, the climate and riparian assessment programs with the with the institute. And Kristen will speak more about the tools uses in resiliency planning. And I think we can hold the questions till the end in the interest of time, unless there's something that really jumps out, Gabriel, as, as needing to be addressed at this time? Nope, not right now. Thank you. So I'm going to stop. And uh, Kristen. Right. Hi, everybody. Uh, can you see it, Emily? Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for um, everybody coming today. Um, it's great to talk about this um, incredible tool. Um, good to have the development team on the call. So I'm going to talk really, you know, not just about resiliency, but really specifically about flooding um, and kind of talk through um, a little bit of work we've been doing and then a bit of some um, case studies and ways to use um, the information that's in the tool. So I, whoops, let's see, I'm not forwarding here. There we go. So hopefully this is, you know, preaching to the choir that you've all seen this or similar slides, but um, this on the left is showing um, existing change that has occurred in the past to extreme precipitation events. Notice, you know, how big the change is in the Northeast. And then on the right, that's showing, um, that was showing uh, projections. So precipitation events are increasing in, in um, frequency and intensity, particularly here in the Northeast. And combining that with accelerated sea level rise, aging and undersized infrastructure, increasing impervious cover, building in high risk areas, and losses of wetland and floodplain ecosystem function, um, there's an increase in flood risk in many, many parts of New York State. And I'm, I'm sure I don't have to tell most of you that. So what's the role of riparian areas in, in thinking about flooding? So um, riparian areas can play a big role in flood abatement. So they influence the timing and volume of floods, peak flows, duration, um, and can reduce uh, erosive stream power. So having healthy streams that can act as buffers, can hold water, um, can benefit uh, your town and um, watersheds in, in cascading ways. So not to belabor this, but just to think a little bit about the pathway. So basically um, riparian system influence flooding through depression, soils, vegetation and woody debris retention, increasing infiltration, evapotranspiration, and ET slowing down water to streams through surface roughness. So through vegetation and, and topographic complexity, increasing channel length and sinuosity um, and slowing or retaining overbank flows, hopefully, you know, if there is a connection between the streams and the systems. This varies depending on where your the riparian system is in the watershed, what type it is, um, a lot of other conditions. But, uh, you know, these are the things that can be influenced by riparian systems that eventually have an effect on flooding. So, you know, I hope the take home here is we've got to make room for rivers to really do what they do so well and do the things that we need them to do. Um, and it's not easy, it's complicated. Like on the left, our, our rivers are often, you know, pinched in between other things that are very important to us, um, buildings, roads, um, bridges. So um, you all know it's complicated. But today here we're to get it, we're talking about the riparian opportunity assessment and sort of thinking about planning um, protection and restoration of riparian systems. And so you can think about doing that at a couple different scales of um, you know spatial scales, but also um, uh, intensity of effort scales. And you know you can look broadly um, at a watershed scale, and then there are more rapid um, or intensive reach or site level approaches. 
And I think we often think, you know, intensive is really the best, the right answer, but I do think there is also information. In some ways that is true, but there's information you can get at a watershed scale that you can't always get at a site sale. So really, if you can marry those approaches, um, you can really get at um, important uh, assessment of riparian systems. And really get at this idea of planning versus just responding to opportunity. You know, in reality, probably there will be both coming into, um, into your decisions to restore or protect riparian systems. But, you know, these tools are helping to at least be prepared for opportunity. Um, so I'm not going to do much about, talk much about the ROA because Emily did such a great job um, setting it up. But uh, I guess the, the only things I'll add here are that, um, and I guess she said this, so maybe I'll just reiterate that, you know, they combined indicators to create some theme scores that's going to come up. And then they also, um, the data is available at two spatial grains. So the sub watershed scale, which is the HUC 12 scale, and then the catchment, which is smaller, um, sort of like reach, reach, uh, reach shed scale. So we did a little bit of work. I had two amazing interns I worked with a couple of years back and they um, looked, did some work on the ROA and they reviewed the ROA. They did some initial interviews with users and potential users, and then they evaluated um, the ROA and similar mm -hmm. tools. Um, and what they found, so a, a number of things from the interviews, what they found was um, that there were lots of opportunity beyond Trees for Tribes for use. So originally this tool was developed mainly to support the Trees for Tribs program. Um, but there's a lot of other opportunities to use the tools. So many things that Emily said, but you know, outreach grant development, um, actually wetland mitigation banking, maybe shouldn't be on that. That was a separate tool. Um, but we did get some feedback that the ROA is complex, sometimes difficult to obtain meaningful results. Um, I think Emily did a really nice job uh, kind of drilling in and showing how it can be useful, um, but you know, but this is one of the things we have to kind of figure out when we think about the ROA. Um, and we heard that users desired an indicator related to flooding. So it already has some, some information um, baked in related to flood abatement, maybe not called that as such. There's no theme, uh, but I'll talk about that a little. So basically, when you think about measuring flood abatement, um, you can think about, you know, at the riparian scale, you think about can that system actually slow or retain water? Can that, you know, is, is that happening? And then you think about the need. So is there um, excessive runoff um, or potentially some, which would happen, you know, upstream of the site or um, flooding sort of demand downstream from the site? So we went through and we looked at a bunch of tools. So they combed through 20 um, restoration and protection prioritization tools and 15 ecosystem services tools um, and pulled out all the indicators that related to runoff factors and retention um, if, if they were looking at, at flooding. And so we then went back to the ROA and we found, you know, lo and behold, a bunch of indicators um, are already in the ROA that actually get at um, flooding to some degree. So we um, played around with, and I won't go into detail with this at all because it's not live in the tool right now, but we played around with combining those indicators into a, a flood theme, flood attenuation theme. And in this case, we did it just using an additive approach, sort of somewhat similar to the approach that was used in other themes. Um, and you can then map, um, I, we did it both at the catchment, I think it was just at the catchment scale, um, you know, whether a place uh, is a high um, flood attenuation opportunity, so there isn't, it's not currently providing flood attenuation, but it could or low. So um, that was with a student, Caroline Smith, who was excellent. But I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to take a little bit simpler approach and talk about what's in the tool right now that you can do if you wanted to tonight. Um, so one of the things that I think Emily mentioned briefly, but I just wanted to call a little bit of attention to is that under the hood of this tool is a, is the way that they, they, um, defined riparian areas. So you can do that many, many ways. Often what happens is it's, you know, some fixed distance from a stream, you know, it's easy to do, 
um, especially in a GIS. But what they, I think, um, wonderfully did was they chose to take more of a geomorphic approach and they used, um, <clears throat> they basically approximated the 50 year flood um, using a method that you know pulls from digital elevation data, the National Hydrography data set, wetlands, and then they had an estimate of this 50 year um, flood height from, from USGS. And then, so this, this is this green here. So all the, all the metrics that are calculated in the ROA are calculated at, at several different spatial grains. So at the um, full extent of the catchment, at the full extent of the subwatershed, and then within the riparian zones. Um, and so these are the riparian zones. And these can be downloaded as a shape file. Um, Again, it's not recommended. They're not regulatory. You know, these aren't, uh, you know, FEMA certified. This is not, but but for planning and um, especially the regulatory maps really do a poor job in headwaters. And so this is a particularly um, good resource to look at, um, to look at where you might find um, extensive riparian zones. So let's see, I wanna make sure I leave time for questions. Um, okay, so, so back to this. So I am just really going to simply look at, on the function side, all I'm going to look at is, is there natural cover in the riparian area? So higher, it means it's providing more retention, lower, it, it, it's providing less. You know, that's not the perfect assumption, but that's, that's what I went with. Runoff risk is what I put as the need side of things. So with the higher runoff risk, there's more, um, runoff coming to the site and there's um, uh, so more need for uh, retention. And then actually this flooding side, it's gonna vary, but first I'm gonna talk about a flood study. So maybe, I hope most of you've heard about the resilient New York flood studies um, there, that are going on throughout the state. I believe they're up to something like 60, I'm not sure, but it's, it's a big number, um, more than 40 for sure. Um, and, they are their flood and ice jam studies, and they go through and they do outreach, collect data, then they run hydraulic and hydrologic models, um, accounting for climate change and identify high risk areas. And then they put up a bunch of very concrete mitigation alternatives at the site and basin wide scales. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Fish Creek, which um, hopefully is, is an important place to many of you up in the Tug Hill. Um, it drains down here into Onoda Oneida Lake. And um, Emily talked about it a little bit in some of her examples. So uh, you can see here, the green is actually where the focus of this flood study was. So that, you know, they use the whole watershed for calculations, but they really um, looked at alternatives and, and um, high risk areas down there. So, you know, it's a big watershed. Um, and they used the 20% increase in flow um, as suggested by New York State DEC for Eastern New York to represent climate change. So quickly, I'll just say that they identified three high risk areas, mostly down along the main stem of Fish Creek um, uh, in the town of Vienna and the village of Sylvan Beach. Um, quite a few in, in that area, a lot of the flooding issues have to do with ice. So, you know, less related to riparian areas, but that's not, wasn't the only source of flooding. So I'm over here, this is a lot of words, apologies for all that's on here, but in their basin wide strategies that they recommended, they had lots of things they recommended, but they did recommend the preservation and conservation of areas, um, protect areas in floodplains that currently provide floodplain storage. And then they also, um, Similarly, they recommended ordinances to protect from future development in, in riparian areas. Um, but, and we did, we looked at, I think it was 27 of these studies and all of them mentioned in their basin-wide strategies, um, something about riparian protection. Though they didn't um, spatially, um, uh, Except in two cases, there were cases where riparian areas were called out spatially in a spatially explicit way. Um, so these these are really just general um, guidances. And so even their site-based uh, measure also recommended um, at a basin-wide scale addressing sources of sedimentation, which obviously um, 
riparian systems can. And this I'll just show just in case you all haven't heard the term flood bench. Basically what it is is um, the area adjacent to a stream is excavated to allow reconnection of a stream to um, a floodplain. So that was some of their recommendations were creating these flood benches. So um, what I did here was, as Tim kind of laid out, there are different ways to access the information in the ROA. And I, uh, unlike what Emily showed, I really just jumped out and I did this in um, a GIS system. So, you know, if you have somebody like, if yourself, if you can do this, um, or if you have somebody like Gabriel who works with you, maybe somebody at your planning department or um, somebody at the county may be able to help you with this if it's not you. I will say what I did was really entry-level GIS stuff. So not super complicated what I'm, what I'm doing here today. So basically I pulled up, um, so thinking back to those, you know, looking at um, retention and, and runoff as the ways of evaluating um, flood um, abatement here. So this is just natural riparian cover um, by the sub watershed. So those bigger, um, those bigger units. And really, as Emily said, what this watershed is generally showing is it's generally pretty forested. Um, especially in the headwaters. But you can drill in a little bit and look and see in the catchment area. So if you look a little finer, there are places where there's actually quite low um, riparian um, uh, natural cover. So you may think about looking at where, um, where you might do some. Um, so anyway, I've, uh, protection is important in this watershed because there are a lot of um, uh, natural cover riparian areas, but you, you might drill into these areas to look at um, uh, where you might restore. So thinking about runoff ratio, so this is only calculated at the catchment level. These areas are where there are these high runoff risks. So if you look at them together, again, so this is this idea of function and need together. Um, you know, you can see some areas where there's there's low function, but there's a pretty high need. Uh, you can make the case that there's high need in the whole watershed because really it's all draining down here. Down here is where they identified all those high risk areas. But if you're looking at a more um, local level, this is a place where you might wanna drill in and really look at opportunities um, for restoration. And again, I'm talking mostly about revegetation, but um, I think reconnecting streams, I, I don't know if I would use, the, you know, you can you can look at this data to evaluate that. Oh, I just threw this in here to say that you can do some of this also within the, the bounds of the, the tools. I just did not. So this is that riparian, this is the riparian buffers um, layer. And that's the area identified. And you can zoom in here, pull up um, aerial imagery underneath and, and see where there's, there's potential opportunities for um, revegetation. And I would suggest possibly where there's this nice wide area, this may be, you'll have to do um, some of those more intensive evaluations, work with your soil and water commission, possibly your planning department, but figure out like, could this be a place where there could be even be more um, connection of the stream to the to the riparian area. Um, so that's one way that that um, you could use this tool in thinking about flood abatement. Um, so this is thinking about it on a. This is just the, the only difference here is that I'm looking at a um, municipal level. So this is um, the town of Leyden. I hope I'm saying that right. This is the the Black River. So it's in the I saw Emily smirk. I hope that was right. Um, I yeah. So this is in the head, headwaters of the the Black River, um, and this is again the coarse scale, so sub watershed scale. Not super useful here at the town of um, at this town level. There's only a handful, um, but you know there's there's less riparian cover, uh, natural vegetation riparian cover here than in the 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 last example I gave. But when you drill down, you can really get a better idea of where there are areas, you know, where there's more um, uh, natural vegetation and when there, where there are areas of less. And you could do the same thing that I just did in the last case, you know, pull up the runoff ratio and then 
look at them together and really drill down into, you know, these are areas where there's particularly low, oops, riparian cover um, and, and high runoff ratio. So these might be places where you did, you take this a step further, look at aerial imagery, do a, a more intensive investigation, work with some um, uh, local person that might have more information, possibly, you, you know, get in touch with landowners, look at local plans. So um, I guess I'll end by saying, I'll reiterate mostly that, um, that Emily shared this already, but we're working on kind of evaluating the tool a bit, um, clarifying some of the goals, you know, and asking, you know, are the goals being met? Who uses the tool? Who could use the tool? Um, what could be added? What is and isn't working so well? Um, and then are there new uses? As Emily said, you know, trends, flood attenuation potentially. And then, um, so we're gonna be doing an assessment um, through interviews and focus groups with users and potential users. So if you're interested or know somebody who you think would be a great um, addition to this, please reach out to myself or Emily. And with that, just uh, thank you so much. I appreciate you all coming today. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Emily. Um, with that, does anyone have any questions before we end for the day. We have a couple of minutes left if there are any. And um, at this time, if you want to ask a, a question verbally, feel free to take yourself off mute and um, ask that that question. Give it another another minute or two. <laughs> But um, we do really appreciate everyone um, that joined us today and shared this valuable feedback that is going to be helpful towards uh, updating this tool. And, um, you know, we will uh, likely get in touch with folks um, that shared some feedback on the registration survey. And as part of this uh, webinar, we'll, li we'll likely, you know, Use uh, find your contact and and um, reach out to you to um, ask you additional questions and and maybe even um, set up kind of a one-on-one -on -one web meeting with our with our water resources institute um, riparian riparian team um, to uh, learn a little bit more about um, you know your your interests and um, you know how we can how we can make this tool useful for you. Emily, we do have one question in the chat. It's how how do you define natural areas and would you exclude areas dominated by invasives? If anyone in the panel could answer those. The, yeah, the natural areas was uh, defined based on land cover in that case. So it would have been all NLCD classes that weren't associated with agriculture or um, development. Uh, w there were many discussions about the use of uh, including invasives in this particular tool and because of the temporal nature of the, the IMAP data, which is what we were looking at using, um, we don't have any direct input of invasives um, in this version of the tool. Yeah, I'll second that what Amy said and, and add that in some cases, it might be debatable whether invasives are still vegetation and maybe they're performing the function we want them to perform. And so, so there you go. Is it, do we? How do we handle that? Some invasives may not be, maybe making it worse, right? But um, how do you handle the function of your natural areas? And that'd be something that'd be great to try to wrestle with for a little bit. And I think we had come across research that identified, you know, that Japanese knotweed can kind of contribute to additional stream bank erosion. And I think we did have kind of a, a theme that looked at Japanese knotweed. Yes, we do have a Japanese knotweed theme. I and think it's still on the map. <laughs> yes. Um, because we saw that as as one where there was a, a really, you know, a strong, a strong link with the need for for restoration and and protection and management to um to address that risk. All right, Any last questions. It's almost one o'clock. And 
Yeah, give it another, give it another yeah. minute. And um, John, yeah, it'd be uh, great to to follow up with you. Um, and the how how the tool is useful in the uh, drinking source water protection program. Do you, would you like to come off mute and just mention your your program real quick? Yeah, it's new to me that it's a, a refinement of the NRI and natural resource work I've been doing for quite a long time. But it's looking at specifically uh, the potential context and ramifications of habitat conditions within a watershed and being able to estimate uh, the potential impacts on starting with surficial a lot of the systems that are well based you know you could even argue that further out but it'd be a bit of a stretch but at least the surficial systems um, in terms of identifying you know remediation or inputs i think it could be could be useful i'm looking at it we're working on a project right now and i'm doing a, a model using some of the new fema uh, bare earth dms that are available so great thanks and i did plug in um a link to that doh dec drinking source water protection program into the chat if anybody would like to um thanks find more Thanks, John. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. As soon as I... Um, and thank you everyone for joining and um, please reach out if you think of anything else. Um, we're happy to help.